if you read announcements, Fred, and see the titles, you may wonder about the title of today's sermon. But stop and think about it. Is God interested in money? You know, there's a, I think, a disrespectful phrase that goes around sometime when somebody is wealthy, you know, like Donald Trump. You know, people would say he's wealthier than God, you know, and, and, and saying, in other words, he's got a lot of money. The implication is that God has money? Does God have money? Speculating today whether it's like the euro, hopefully not the drachma. Oh, but does God have money? And if God has money, does he use it? And if he uses it, how would God use money? Does God care how you use money? Does God care how you view the use of money? Now, money is a subject that affects everybody because every one of you in this room uses money. But what about God? Let's let Christ answer this question in part. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We get an answer to the question, is God interested in money? Mark chapter 12 and verse 41, the New International Version. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple's treasury. Now, some of you like to people watch. Uh, my wife and I went to uh, Epcot Center in Disney World when we were doing our marriage seminar in Orlando. and, and uh, most enjoyed watching the people. And if you're a people watcher and you sit back and watch and see what they do and you wonder their backgrounds and many things about them and, and if, if, if people actually have mirrors sometime you wonder by the way they've dressed. But, uh, <laughs> but here's Jesus and he was a people watcher and he sat across from the temple and he watched as people put their money into the box. And as a result of watching them, he was drawing conclusions about those individuals. Many rich people threw in large amounts. Verse 42. But the poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Verse 43, and calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. And the disciples, probably knowing the disciples and how sometimes thick they were, were kind of wondering, huh? Did she, did she have a stash that we didn't know about? Or what's the deal here? And he said, verse 44, they gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything all she had to live on. So Christ was sitting there evaluating people, actually, and seeing what their relationship with money was. And, as a result, seeing what their hearts, their attitudes were, their willingness, what their mind was on, what was most important to them. Luke chapter 16 is a, a somewhat similar situation. And actually, you know, the Bible talks a, a whole lot about money and more than you might like to wish. Uh, but it talks a lot about money. Most of the parables, when you uh, read them, have something to do with money or the attitude towards the things that you have. But Luke chapter 16, you know, one answer to the, the question, does God use money? Does God use money? And if he does, how? Luke chapter 16 and verse 10, I think, answers that question, does God use money? 
New International Version again, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. He's looking to see what a person's heart is, what their attitude is, uh, if they're greedy, if they're generous, if they uh, are willing to obey the commandments, don't steal, uh, among other things. And he says, verse 11, so if you have not been trustworthy with handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Now the obvious here is that God is watching that to determine it, isn't he? He's, he's looking at each of us to say, in regards to money, do I care how you spend money? Or do I care your view of money and how important it is to you, how well you handle it? The answer is yes, God does. Now God is looking to give us something greater than what we have in this life. And there are many ways to be tested. We've, we've, a number of the sermons recently have talked about trials and tests. And trials and tests are to help God determine how to use you in the kingdom. And he says that even with money, frankly, he says if you're trustworthy handling world wealth, uh, then you'll get something else. Verse 12, he says, and if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you the property of your own? Now, we're all looking here to inherit the kingdom of God, right? And I think we've all speculated that when the kingdom comes and everything's settled down, uh, that Jesus Christ uh, over us is going to be handing out planets or areas of service or cities. I'll give you ten cities. Now, whose cities are they? They're God's. Uh, you get to be over it. How are you going to do with that? Well, how you did in this life is, uh, depends a lot on what he's going to do with this in the next. Well, it's not just money. Again, the Bible's pretty plain with that. But he talks about being trustworthy with somebody else's property and then who will give you property of your own. Verse 13, no man can serve two masters, either they hate one and love the other, be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money if one thing is your priority. Now we all use money, we all have to use money, we're all told to use money wisely, but when money becomes our God, then we're not having God as our God. We've got something in place of God. Okay, so he says money is frankly pretty important. And God uses money to see whether you'll be trustworthy with the things that he plans to give you later. But see, yeah, does God use money? Yes, he does. Verse 14, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. <laughs> you know, I don't know who he thinks he is. Talking about money, he's probably just after my money. Verse 15, he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's eyes. What God determined from watching them and their attitude towards money determine their heart. And frankly, God does the same thing with us. God watches our giving habits. He watches our attitudes. He sees what's in our heart as a result of that, in this country, green stuff. Or checkbook, or credit card, or whatever else it might be. Now while there are many ways that God can test our hearts, one of those is through the proper use and attitude towards money. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Again, we see that you know, God is interested in us having the big picture. And while we have the big picture and while we do the most important things in this process of working towards the kingdom of God, if you're faithful in little, which he puts money into that category, you'll be faithful in much. His attitude, I mean, his, his, his focus is not on money. 
his focus is that you got the big picture and if you have the big picture then you'll keep the commandments you'll do well with the little you've been given and whether it's responsibilities or whether it's money or whether it's a trial or the many other ways that he tests our hearts it's so we'll have the big picture Matthew 23 23 we see again he's interested in money but in relation to the big picture Matthew 23, 23, New Living Translation says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. And, and that said something about it too, is that they were wanting to do the least they could get away with. You know, the tiny account, but I don't, you know, out of my little cumin seeds here, I, I, I don't want to give one more than I have to. You know, it was that attitude. And while they were looking at the law and, 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 and saying, well, but I, but I give, you know, and I'm, I, I, I give my money, and so that's got to count for something. But their attitudes weren't right. Their hearts weren't right. And that's what he was looking for and how they used it. And he said, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe. Yes, but get money in perspective. Get tithing in perspective. Get how you use money in perspective. He said, you should tithe, but don't neglect the more important things. If they had tithed with the right attitude and understanding of why tithing, then Christ would have commended them for tithing along with their right attitude. But he had to get the proper relationship involved. Tithing reinforces our creator and created relationship. God created us. He made everything. And the tithing has to do with our relationship with God. It's not a money issue with God. God doesn't need cash. He doesn't have to have cash to function, but frankly, he uses it. He brings blessings to those who properly use money. Now, the question, does God have money? Now, I don't think any of us would imagine that God's sitting up there with a fat wallet or, or with a big bank account or a, a gigantic credit card or something like that. But on the other hand, Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, The Lord owns the world and everything in it. The heavens and the highest heavens are his. So, yeah, technically he owns everything. And if there's money out here and whatever, it's gold or, or some other denomination, he owns everything. But more specifically, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 Does God have money? Well, yeah, he does. You know, I'd ask you if you have money. Some of you would honestly say no. <laughs> not, not, a, not on a positive uh, side. Uh, I, I was hearing one person talk about, uh, talk about, he, he said, like I have no money. And he, he, he said, in, in fact, I, I've got, I, I, I came up, a bum came up to me and said, he said, buddy, he said, I've, I have no money. The guy said, wow, that is incredible. He says, you're $18,000 richer than I am. Uh, he was $18,000 in debt, but, uh, you know, everything's kind of relative, but. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? He can't take something from somebody that he doesn't have. You know, you can't rob a bum because he doesn't have anything to rob, right? Well, but God's got something to rob. He said, Yeah, you rob me. You, you steal what's mine. And he says, Yes, well, how do we rob you? How, how can you rob God? He didn't steal anything from God. God didn't have money, does he? And he 
he answers in tithes and offerings. In fact, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. You're, you're taking something that belongs to me. This is mine. Yes, I own the whole world, but I, I've let you play with it. Okay? It's, a, you, you, it's, it's, it's okay. It's yours. You've earned it or whatever. But then he says, verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This is my investment. This is the part that I claim, that I own. It's mine. And then he goes on to say, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven to pour out so much blessing on you, you won't have room to receive it. In verse 11, I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines of your fields won't cast their fruit, says the Lord, and all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be called a delightful land, says the Lord. I've got some money that I claim that is my portion and don't take it from me. Use it the way I say to use it. Now there are people who don't believe in the tithe and, and uh, in, in fact you go to religious forums and uh, there, there was one where this pastor wrote up an article and said, can we preach the tithe? And he's throwing it out to other ministers. And this article was, can we preach the tithe? And, and uh, one minister is not in the United Church of God or any other churches of God. It's uh, in the world generally. This one guy wrote back and said, it's a good thing to challenge our traditions and tithing is just that, a tradition. As you pointed out, tithing was brought to fulfillment in Christ. In fact, tithing is really a form of tax more than a form of giving. I recommend we drop the use of the word tithe, replacing it with giving. There's plenty of New Testament scripture to teach on the importance of giving. Another minister wrote and said tithing was something of the old covenant effective for Judaic people. So the answer to the title, can we preach the tithe, is no, we can't preach tithing. And he said it has no place in the new covenant. One may give all or none to one or all. Tithing is worship, sounds like baloney. So he calls tithing baloney. Now, we just heard God say that it's more important to him than that. In fact, it's very important to him. And others said, as a pastor, I've told the members of my congregation not to tithe. That'd be like a minister standing up and telling people, marriage is between a man and a man or woman and woman or whatever you want to marry yourself to. Uh, it's, you don't have to listen to God's definition of marriage. Well, what gives anybody the right to contradict God? But he says, I've told people to be generous. God commands that. But if we're saved by grace, why do we go back to the law to find out how much we should give? My question, when God says, you've robbed me through tithes, okay, at what point in history did that tithe cease to be God's? At what point in history did God relinquish his claim to a tenth of what we earn? Jesus died on the cross, you know, he died, oh, okay, I don't own stuff anymore. So I, I, do what you want, because apparently I don't have claim to it anymore. Uh, you've been released. Uh, give if you feel like it. In fact, if you're really righteous, you'll give more than a tithe, but all bets are off. And today I want to discuss God's use of money through tithing, and then obviously then our use of money through tithing. And what is tithing about, and is it still in effect? And why does he have us to tithe? Again, my answer to at what point in time did the tithe cease to be God's, at the same time, point in time the Sabbath ceased to be God's holy time. <laughs> God did not cease to have his holy time as the Sabbath. 
he didn't cease to have his holy money as his to tell us how to deal with that. Now in Israel there were three types of tithes that were commanded by God. There was God's tithe to, given to the Levites and the priests for their service to God's people. Uh, there was a tithe so they could go to the feast. There was tithing so the poor would be taken care of. Now I'm not going to go into the Old Testament scriptures to specifically prove tithing, but we will look at scriptures and see what God says about this. Uh, a tithe is defined, it just simply means a tenth, uh, and it's a tenth of a person's wealth. It's proportionate to your wealth. Percentage-wise, the tithe from the poor is the same as the tithe from the wealthy. Obviously, the person that is on a restricted income uh, such as Social Security and that type of thing, is it's not a, uh, a, a tithe base. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but the tithe of the poor, if you earn $10, your tithe is a dollar. It's 10%. Now, if you're wealthy and you earn $100,000, then your tithe is $10,000. Wow. Yeah, but you got $100,000 that other person doesn't have. See? So it's proportionate uh, and it is fair. You know, they're, they're talking about revising the tax system in the U.S. to go to a flat tax because that is supposedly will, will make things fair. This world will never be fair, but uh, anyway, it's a principle. Christ said, I will build my church. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. It will always be. And in order for there to be a functioning church, the church is just like the rest of us. All of the world, we function on money. And if we're to do the things he said to do, then it takes money. So there are three basic needs of a church, and that's to support the work and preaching the gospel, feeding the flock, uh, for people attending the feasts, and support of the needy. Today, let's talk about the support uh, of the work in the church. Turn to Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Again, here is God's claim to things. This is what God says is his. Now he again makes it plain in Malachi that if you don't respect what is mine, then you're stealing that from me. And again, these, these guys that say, well, God doesn't own that anymore. <laughs> That's not his. That's mine. And I'm so generous, I will give God some of it. Oh, that makes us sound righteous. I mean, way more righteous than the Pharisees. Leviticus 27, verse 30, here is the principle. Here's what God said when he was dealing with Israel. Leviticus 27, 30, and says, And all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or of the fruit of the land or of, of the tree, is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. God says, a tenth of what you produce, that belongs to me. It's the Lord's, it's holy to the Lord. Well, it just says the seed of the land and the fruit of the tree. Well, he even goes on and says, okay, don't get excited. Verse 32, concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock and whatever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy to the Lord. Yes, it does include your cattle. It includes the stuff you do. Now, there are people who say, well, you know, it only says to tithe on the fruit of the land and the, the tree and, and cattle. And frankly, I haven't owned a cow for quite a few years. And this is Arizona, and we don't grow stuff very well here. So I don't have to tithe, and just farmers have to tithe. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, just well, I won't justify that with, uh, with a justification. Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. Now God says, okay, the tenth, that's mine, okay? This is the stuff that you don't rob from me. But I ask the question, does God spend money? 
How does God use money? Numbers chapter 18, verse 21, he says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel. Yeah, the tithe is mine. I have determined what to do with it. I'm giving it to the Levites, it says, as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And so the principle was the Israelites would tithe and then God says, that's mine. Okay, don't steal that from me. You give it to the Levites. Because the Levites are doing what I'm asking them to in doing this work. Well, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, God didn't ask if you agreed with that, right? He just said, this is what I'm doing with my money. I get to spend my money the way I want. And that's how I'm choosing to spend my money. Okay? Doesn't God have the right to do that? I think obviously. Numbers 18, verse 24. New century version. Numbers 18, 24, it says, But when the Israelites give a tenth of everything they make to me, now the Israelites give part of their crop or their cattle or whatever is they're told to to God money if they're on a monetary basis and I will give that tenth to the Levites as a reward so I'm choosing to spend my money okay you have a problem with that verse 25 the Lord said to Moses speak to the Levites and tell them you will receive a tenth of everything the Israelites make. Oh, well, that's cool. Thank you, God. <laughs> you know, that's what he says to do. And he says, which I will give to you. But you must give a tenth of that back to the Lord. You know, I'm, the, the, the ministry today are not Levites. And of course, that's another argument against tithing. Well, you know, the ministers aren't Levites. That's true. If, if we can't understand a principle here and what God did and how he chose to do it then and then the extension that it goes on today, then we, we may be looking at money wrong, frankly. But this is the way God chose to do it. And he says, and, and, and so, you know, I've, I, I've received tithes uh, in the form of a paycheck uh, that comes through the home office for uh, a while. And I've always tithed on what I've received uh, in tithe, so you kind of tithe double in a way, or give it back, because it says the, if the, the, those that t receive of the tithes, well, you've you got to tithe too, okay? Because that's what is mine, okay? So you give it back. In verse 31, and you Levites and your families may eat this food anywhere you wish. Uh, now, as we go on to other uh, aspects of tithing, we'll see that some of the tithe was not anywhere you wish. There was a, more of a restriction to that. Uh, but he said it's for your compensation for serving in the tabernacle. So, nobody hear that? It's not a like a nuclear holocaust or anything. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. And some of you with your hearing aid didn't even hear that, but there was this audible. And so when it's time for the bomb to go off, you better turn that hearing aid up. But anyway. In the New Testament, Christ sent his disciples to do Christ's work, to do God's work. He sent them to preach the gospel, and to prepare a people. Notice what Christ said in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. You see, God doesn't change the principle. There is a change in application because there's the church in the wilderness and there's the New Testament church. Well, the principle is the same. Uh, the Levites, if they were to spend their time serving God and the people in the temple, uh, the tabernacle, then they had to live also. And God says, I'm giving my money to them. Okay. And the principle was the same here. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5. 
I'll read this out of the Living Bible. It says, Jesus sent the disciples out with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or Samaritans, only the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. That was their particular assignment. And verse 7, go out and announce to them the kingdom of heaven is near. Preach the gospel. Okay, so when I go out and I preach the gospel, I'll, I'll be glad to do that, but I've noticed that I've got to eat. And I've got to pay the uber donkey when you know we go from one place to the other or whatever <laughs> verse 8 heal the sick raise the dead cure the lepers cast out demons give as freely as you have received you're out there doing the work and what does he say about that verse 9 he said don't make or don't take any money with you oh Good, I didn't have any money to take with me anyway, so that's, that's okay. You know. Verse 10, don't even carry a duffel bag or extra clothes and shoes or even a walking stick. And then he says at the end of verse 10, for those you help should feed and care for you. So he sent them out and said, you're going to be doing my work preaching my gospel of the kingdom of God. You're going to be serving those people. And when you do, Frankly, they need to take care of you for doing my work. The same principle, the Levites were serving in the temple and God said, I'm giving them my tithe so they can serve you and me in the temple. The principle is exactly the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you know, there were grumblings and whinings about things as there always have been among God's people Old and New Testament uh, up to current time but here's a situation where the subject of paying the people that were preaching the gospel and feeding the flock came up and some people didn't want to do it and some weren't um, it, it, it's obvious that you know, the ministry then wasn't going into people's bank accounts and finding out whether they were sending in their tithe check or not. Same now. I gotta honestly say, I, I have no clue uh, how much or whether you tithe, uh, what you do. That's between you and God. I'm, I'm not here trying to check up or whatever. And, and I, I, Rick, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting a raise after today. This is not, <laughs> it will not affect me at all. I, mean, I just do want to preach the truth out of the Word of God, though. It's my job. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 3. This is the New Jerusalem Bible. It says, to those that want to interrogate me, this is my answer. And, you know, he's being interrogated about this issue of, do I have to send money to you? He says, verse 4, don't we have every right to eat and drink? He said, by God, we've been given certain rights, actually, from God's perspective. Verse 5, and every right to be accompanied by a Christian wife, like the other apostles, like the brothers of the Lord, and like Paul or Peter. He said, it's, it's, it's them, it's their families. They've got to support their families, and so they need the compensation. And as Jesus told them, you know, let those that you feed care for you. And he's, he's, he's using these, again, biblical principles and laws to show how God applies this topic of money and what all it means. Verse 6, are Barnabas and I the only ones who have no right to stop working? Verse 7, he said, even look at it from a, from, from a, a carnal point of view. Even from a carnal point of view. And then he'll go on to say, okay, now let's look at it from God's point of view, and isn't God more just than, like, the world? Verse 7, he says, What soldier would ever serve in the army at his own expense? And who is there who would plant a vineyard and never eat the fruit from it, or would keep a flock and not feed on the milk from its flock? Verse 8 says, Do not think that this is mere worldly wisdom. Okay, those are don't just... Take my word for it, let's, let's look into the Word of God and see how God works and what does God say. 
He says, doesn't the law say exactly the same? It's written in the law of Moses, verse 9. And then he quotes a, a, a kind of an unusual verse, frankly. And if you were looking to say, oh, he's just trying to get their money, and that's why he's using this totally out of context, you might, you know, if it wasn't here in the Bible and that's what it says, you might think that. But he says, here's what's written in the law. You must not muzzle the ox when treading out the corn. Is it the oxen God's concerned with here? But God uses a principle even in your day-to-day -day activities. But he says, verse 10, or is it not said entirely for our sake? The greater principle, even of not muzzling your ox when he's there, treading out the corn there on the, on the grindstone. He said it's, it's really referring to a spiritual principle regarding how God deals with his church. He says it for our sake. Clearly it was written for our sake because it's right that whoever plows should plow with the expectation of having his share. Whoever threshes should thresh with the expectation of having his share. Verse 11. If we've sown the seed of spiritual things in you, is it too much to ask that we should receive from you a crop of material things? Um, he's talking about tithes. He's talking about money or goods that the people would provide for them doing the work. It's just God's way of doing things. He said that with the Levites. He said, they're doing my work in the temple. I'm giving my money to them. And he says the same thing. When you go out there, the people you care for uh, should feed you. Uh, so, again, what's, what's changed? Principles reinforced here. Verse 12, others have been given such rights over you and don't we deserve more? In fact, we've never exercised this right. To the contrary, we've put up with anything rather than obstruct the gospel in any way. Uh, I've gone non-career in the ministry a couple of times uh, to not be uh, employed in the ministry. Um, and I didn't take tithes for a period of time uh, because I chose not to. I will do so again upon retirement. Uh, but that is my, uh, my, my choice on that. But God says it can be reimbursed. Verse 13, don't you realize that the ministers in the temple get their food from the temple? It's going back to that law that he had in the Old Testament. And it was going on at that time. He said, those who serve at the altar can claim their share from the altar. Verse 14, in the same way, the Lord gave instruction that those who preach the gospel should get their physical, monetary living from the gospel. Okay? That's just God's law, God's way of doing things. Paul said, if you have a problem with that, talk to God about it. And I suggest you talk to God about it. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, it's interesting as he's talking with this group of people who had been supporting him. And again, sometimes Paul worked making tents you know, with Aquila and Priscilla. He was there and they, they were in the same business and they made tents together. Paul and Barnabas went for a while without receiving the tithes. They chose that because they... He didn't want the controversy. It wasn't worth dealing with. You know, let, let God deal with people's attitudes and hearts. And, and then, but it came time, well, like we, we, we just can't keep on this anymore. We, we need some support. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The Living Bible said, but even so, you've done right in helping me in my present difficulty. Verse 15 of Philippians 4, As you well know, when I first brought the gospel to you and then went on my way, leaving Macedonia, only the Philippians became my partners in giving and receiving. No other church did this. You're the ones that were my support system financially, you know, giving goods and help so I could preach the gospel, he said. Verse 17, 
But though I appreciate your gifts, what makes me happiest is the well-earned reward you will have because of your kindness. Now this reminds me of Malachi chapter 3. So bring you the tithes into the storehouse and test me and see whether I will pour out a gift on you for your generosity in helping the gospel to be proclaimed and the flock to be fed. And he said, it's the, what makes me happy is the well-earned reward you'll have. And it's that principle again of God sees what we do with the tithe and money we have and he blesses accordingly. Verse 18, at the moment I have all I need and more than I need. I'm generously supplied with the gifts you sent me when Epaphroditus came. And then it says those gifts that were given to Paul for doing the work said they are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that pleases God well. Again, is God interested in your money? Well, he's interested in your heart and your attitude. And when we have the right attitude, and that woman who just put in that little bit of money, it wasn't the amount God was interested in, it wasn't he wasn't uh, going after the wealthy, uh, this wasn't a plea to, you know, to, to pad somebody's expenses. This was looking at the heart and said it pleases God well. He looks at the heart. Verse 19, and it is he who will supply all your needs from his riches and glory because of what Christ has done for us. And again, you tie this directly in with Malachi chapter 3. Do what I ask and I will bless you as a result. You will gain from it. And I think so many of us could talk from experience that, you know, when the tithing time comes, God provides and he, he, he makes things work and work well. Sometimes there's tests involved with that, but he does test the heart in the process. But shouldn't it just be giving? Again, didn't God do away with tithing? And he just wants us to give and give generously. Well, yes. Let's read again Matthew chapter 23, 23. And again, take Jesus here. And what Jesus was saying to the disciples and is this principle of, and, and law of tithing uh, abolished in some way? And why would it be? Why would it be? Matthew 23, 23. This is the simple English version. I read this a little earlier. It said, It will be horrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. It's true that you give God 10% of everything you have. You even give him 10% of your spices and mint and dill and cumin. But you forget the more important things in the law, being fair to other people, giving mercy and faith. And again, this is the uh, simple English version of the Bible, but it says you should always tithe. But you must remember to do the more important things too. He's telling them, well, yeah, you should be tithing. So no question here. Because it's a, a law and a principle. 10% is God's. Now, we can go into Hebrews chapter 7, and it's a, a good read on the topic, but it shows that um, the, the superiority of the Melchizedek priesthood over the Levitical priesthood, and tithing wasn't just done for the Levitical priesthood, it was done to Melchizedek before that, Melchizedek being Christ, and Christ has the right to your tithe. And so it's not just a Levitical thing. And then in the New Testament, the, 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 uh, the New Testament church did the work of God after 70 AD, the temples destroyed. They still went on preaching the gospel and doing the work and spreading the word of God. And God blessed people for that. Now the next time we'll talk about the uh, feast tithe and we'll talk about the administration of the tithe uh, to the poor and uh, the blessings that come from uh, further obedience to God. So this is tithing part one. We'll come back with tithing part two.